So I think a lot of us are in two minds about this new release. I mean, the backstory of these pieces is fantastic. There have been some great new revisions, but apart from this, this color shift, it's quite an underwhelming launch, let's be honest. And seeing the family of pieces together, the first thing that came to mind was, and this is a genuine question, has Omega just copied Seiko? Because I see these watches as a range, and I think, save the ocean. Now, maybe this was woven into the narrative from the beginning, but to celebrate such a milestone, the 75th anniversary of the Seamaster, I think the brand could have done a few things differently and even more subtly. Let's dive in. The Seamaster is a very important watch to me. With some great family ties, it's been worn by my grandparents, and I chose the original Seamaster 300 as my first watch. To this day, it's still the most coveted watch in my collection, and I doubt that will ever change. By me saying this, I'm telling you that I greatly appreciate the watch and its history. They genuinely have some of the best designs of any sports watch in the industry, and with an important milestone such as this, I would have thought the history of this collection would have been better emphasized. Now maybe we will be seeing more of this by the end of the year with some new releases, but I mean to celebrate 75 years and not to create some kind of tribute watch like they normally do, like a 1948 CK2518, something to emphasize this historic moment, you know, and with that we could have something like a white dial CK2913, you know, some great room for some reinterpretations, some historic inspirations and creating some designs that would look even more exciting. Omega has such a broad repertoire for pulling this kind of inspiration, but I can understand why they're focused on the modern series of pieces because these are the ones we closely associate with the brand today. And by the end of the video, I will talk more about improvements and design adjustments that I would have liked to have seen done. And if I'm being honest, what I liked and appreciated more from this launch was not so much the watches, but the vision. The way of celebrating a dedication to water, a dedication to precision. Two things that have guided the development of the Seamaster over the last three quarters of a century. Realistically though, what made these releases unique is the whole concept of grouping all of the core Seamasters together under one banner and adopting a similar color palette from light to dark. And this whole celebration of depth and how these gradients change as the watches go down deeper, it's brilliant. I cannot think of how a campaign could have been done better to encapsulate a family of water going watches. But then seeing some of these colors, a handful of these combinations work better than others. Some emphasize the blue elements too much, others are far more subtle. And then some truly look washed out. In direct light, in indirect light, the details are lost. Let's talk about the five watches that made a standout. I think talking about eight would go on for too long. The Aquaterra 41mm and the World Time, using this ice blue, summer blue dial configuration. One thing I do really appreciate that hasn't been noticed by many is they have color matched the date window. It's using a pastel blue color, which is not harsh like white or black, and it doesn't stand out. It looks very decent. But to the Seamaster 300, I'm in two minds about this watch. I'm a huge fan of the 57 collection. I love these older inspired Seamasters, but the use of blue here seems a bit too heavy. I can understand what they were going for with this ice blue on the plots and on the hands, but on the bezel, and when you look at it entirely, a lot of it seems lost. I never thought in my life I would say that they would be using too much blue, but this is a clear example of that, unfortunately. And then to the Professional 300M, the sunburst dial does seem to wash out a lot of elements here too. The brightness of the blue on this dial in direct sunlight looks almost too electric. So similar to the 300, the Professional 300M looks too vibrant. And these many blues clash with one another. I think what's been the issue with these mid-level dive watches, you know, the ones that travel down to 300 meters, is that the colors are just too close to one another. And because of that, there is no clear distinction between the two. And as we know, contrast is key when it comes to a dive watch. But onto the two models that were done very, very well in this lineup, and that's the Ploprof and the Ultra Deep. The Ploprof is especially now completely reworked, reintroduced with a monoblock case construction, slightly smaller size, better case finishing. Gone is the period correct mesh bracelet. We now have a far more period correct neoprene strap. And this watch really does possess everything from an adjustment to the bezel to the text on the dial and how it's arranged. And compared to the other models we've just discussed, such a fantastic understanding of blue and color theory and how these parts all match throughout the piece. From the deep blue used on the pusher, on the strap, around the bezel, how that marries with the lighter blue of all the numerals. That lighter blue then works into the plots on the dial, the darker blue for the hour hand, and this bright ice blue for the minute hand, which as we know, historically, should be orange. The sunbrush dial just adds an even better emphasis to the package. 
Factoring all of this in that it's a top loading case design like the original is the cherry on top of the cake but then there are a lot of drawbacks. The fact that this new model does not have an applied Omega logo, doesn't have a date complication, it's lacking that nuance of a mesh bracelet and is a far more sterile execution. I guess I could liken it to a watch like the Pelagos FXD next to the standard Pelagos in the collection where this one has been beautifully done with its choice of color, it's been stripped down to its basics, definitely speaks to that past design. Frankly, this is the best handled watch in this entire collection, and if you disapprove, then you are wrong. <laughs> and I never thought I would see the day when a Ploprof would take the prize. But there you go, this looks exquisite, and I think this is just the beginning of what we're going to see in the future. A new Ploprof line is definitely on the cards. And then to the Ultra Deep, which is a near black finish throughout, and how that marries with this very light blue, it's a great contrast, it works extremely well. And the fact that with these two last pieces, the deeper they go, the darker it gets, you can see how well they work with the lighter blue color choices. The really nice detail to this watch is the texture on the dial, which is a one-to-one -one mapping of the floor of the Mariana Trench. And it's especially nice to have at the lowest segment of the dial, visually illustrating this transition from shallow to deep. Instead of just using colors to play with depth, going the extra step with adding texture is a really nice level of detail. And then the real party trick, by shining a black light on the dial, you see that it says Omega was here, handwritten script, hand-drawn illustrations. It's a cool novelty. But in saying all of this, the point I still think stands that I just feel Seiko Save the Ocean was a very important inspiration to this collection. And as we know, the family of watches in that category has been around for a very long time and they've done exceptionally well, from the entry level all the way up to high spec pro specs. And I think it primarily has to do with their approach of adding texture to their dials, as well as the fact that they use light blues, all sorts of blue variations to, to differentiate the pieces in the collection. I'm afraid to say that Seiko beat Omega to the punch when it's down to using texture and colors on their dials especially in this manner. So while I appreciate the vision, I love the narrative. I think it's one of the best kinds of stories that you could have to propose when you're talking about a dive watch and reaching those levels of depth and how those colors bleed into one another. I still think this collection could have been done better and simpler, frankly. If this collection was made tighter with not eight pieces, but maybe five, starting with the special edition 1948 CK2518, I had to remember that, and end with the Ploprof. And in there, you can show off the five most important watches that are very much the cornerstone pieces to the Seamaster collection. So starting with the 1948 original, I mean, the 75th anniversary, you have to have that watch in there. Then the next one up can be the Seamaster 300, the CK2913 with an inverse white dial to play around with this whole design ethos. I don't believe the brand has ever experimented with this before and I think that contrast would work so well. In this example, I'm pairing it with a mesh bracelet. Then look at the Professional 300M and add simple things like a tapering bracelet. Possibly remove the helium escape valve or make it slightly smaller. Just a few small touches to improve it. Then you can go down the route of the planet Ocean, maybe also using white as one of your core colors. And come to think of it, maybe white and gilt would be such a nice color pairing, really symbolizing that anniversary feel. Talking about King Midas and Poseidon, there has to be something in there. My hope is still there that we will get a 165.024, maybe that'll be next year, who knows at this point. And then you finish off with this amazing new Ploprof with improved aesthetics, a slightly smaller size, great new details, a callback to the past watch with a top loading design. It would have been brilliant. But then I think my whole argument around this launch is that it was done very well. I love everything about it. I love the storytelling and the way that these colors were used. I just think it felt a little too safe, a little bit too widespread and would have benefited more if the collection was tapered down, made a bit more specific and even more important as a landmark moment. But that's my two cents on the matter. Some hits, some misses. The Ploprof looks insane. And to pay tribute to an entire family of this watch is quite special. And if anything, it shows you how these watches have developed over the years, from the simple time and date all the way down to 20,000 feet. The Seamaster is one of the most prominent dive watches in the world, one of the most important watches to Omega. And I'm hoping throughout the rest of this year that we get to see more of them. Don't get me wrong, I love the neatness. I love the whole package of seeing these watches displayed in front of you and, and justifying the different depths that they travel and how the color gradient changes. It's fantastic. I don't think I've ever seen a release so coherent in that way. I think to mark such a monumentous moment in the Seamaster history, bearing in mind this comes from someone who loves the watches, should have just been a bit more impactful. And they could have done it. 
I mean, I know that they've created the 1948 model a lot, the, the CK2518, but that piece should have been front and center. It could have been a manual wind, something really elegant with a grand faux enamel dial. You know, some really beautiful artisanal finishing, a brass movement, something to symbolize this occasion. And at the end of it all, this is just a pedantic person speaking, but I would want to have seen those icons emphasized more and for them to make the impact. The modern watches are cool, but just a color variation is not going to necessarily symbolize the anniversary as much as, you know, a really big leap in design and refinement, similar to how the Ploprof was done. That watch is excellent. But anyway, I think I've spoken long enough on this matter. Thank you so much for taking the time to watch this video, and I'll see you in the next one.